Greetings, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to, let me adjust my chair, another episode of People's Power Hour here in Luke Mon Nation. You are watching this on either Luke Mon Nation, the most dangerous show on social media, or on Black Power Media, which is the most dangerous platform on social media. Welcome to People's Power Hour in Lukeman Nation. I am Jackie Lukeman, the People's Prophetess, and we're going to talk about some really interesting topics tonight. Really glad you have joined me for another Friday night. Thank you so much. You could have been anywhere in the world doing anything else in the world, but here you are here with me, and I appreciate that so very, very much much. Let me look over in the chat to see what we've got going on to get things started off tonight. We have a new member, Tandesizwe Chimoringa. Tandesizwe, Tandesizwe, thank you so much for becoming a new member. Welcome, welcome to the BPM family. We are so glad to have you. And yes, do check out the video that Dante Seasway did with uh, Jared Ball earlier today, it is fantastic. Check it out on the channel. You will not regret it. Greetings, Comrade Kwame, David Silberg, Quaker Anarchist, Manny Nile, Ricky Ryan, Sugar Sham, Nelson Mercer. I know we're a little early, so folks are kind of sliding in. And it's raining here on the East Coast. I don't know what is doing uh, everywhere else uh, on the rest of wherever you are. So I know people are taking a little time to get here and that's cool. Um, whew, I got to breathe because I left work. You know, we do the live hour on By Any Means Necessary at 3 p.m. from 3 to 4 p.m. The show is actually two hours long. The show is in its entirety from 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time to four o'clock PM Eastern time. And people, I, I'm not, I say that every day <laughs> during the live hour, but I think people forget. Um, so they only hop on the rumble video stream from three to four. That's what we call the live hour because that is actually live. Um, so people think that we only have a one hour show. We do not by any means necessary on Radio Sputnik is a two hour show starting at 2 p.m. And you can listen to the show the first hour from 2 to 3 p.m. live on Sputnik.com. Click on the little headphones at the top of the screen and listen live at two o'clock p.m. at the top of the hour for the first six to maybe eight minutes. I have a monologue uh, usually, and then we have two to three uh, interviews, fantastic interviews with organizers, with international um, uh, uh, figures, uh, with uh, movement people across the country and around the world who are in this struggle against capitalism and imperialism and for the human rights of all people. So do check out By Any Means Necessary on Radio Sputnik, where I am the co-host with Sean, the voice Blackman. Every weekday from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. And if you miss the show, you can get our uh, the entire show uh, the next day that's posted to the like today's show will be available like sometime Sunday night, I think. So uh, our that day's show is usually available the next day on sputnik.com slash radio. And you scroll down the page and you click on our show by any means necessary. You get all of our previous shows. And I just found out that um, we, we have been, uh, but we've been allowed back on some streaming platforms. So I'm going to check out which streaming platforms we have been allowed back on because back in February, March of last year, after Russia's, uh, special military action in Ukraine, um, all of the streaming platforms booted all of the Sputnik shows off of the, their platforms and YouTube but, uh, booted Sputnik off of um, uh, its platform as well. This is why Sputnik uh, shows are on Rumble. That wasn't by choice. It was just the only 
video streaming platform that would allow Sputnik shows to stream on there. But hopefully we'll be able to get back on YouTube. Not sure. I, I don't think I really care either way because y'all going to find us wherever we go. But I am going to find out which uh, streaming platforms we have been uh, secretly and silently with no fanfare whatsoever and no notice allowed back on. And as soon as I find out, I'll let you know. All right, so, ooh, Lord, today, I, I have been trying really hard to um, do better at saying no to speaking engagements because it's, I have to, I mean, it's it's work, right? It, it takes an effort. I, you know, I do some preparation most of the time. Um, sometimes I can just get on the mic and just, you know, flow. But I do like to do some preparation so I can know exactly, you know, what I'm talking about. Um, but it, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of energy. And believe it or not, thinking uses a whole lot of brain power. And uh, that's been really all of the organizing I'm doing, the work I'm doing, um, you know, my regular job at By Any Means Necessary, the organizing I'm doing with the Black Alliance for Peace and Pan-African Community Action and with my church, um, and then these additional speaking engagements really, really wearing me down. Um, um, and, and my body is revolting against it. So I've been having these um, uh, panic attacks. Um, and my dialysis nurses and doctors are all just like, it's stress because you're doing too much. And this is your body's way of telling you you're doing too much. So I'm really, really, really working on um, cutting back on a whole lot of stuff. So no, um, no uh, uh, extra speaking engagements for a while. <laughs> I just got off a, a call with um, uh, some Filipino organizers <laughs> and uh, Pan-African Community Action Comrade. Yeah, I'm going to see how well I stick to that. I'm going to try. I did just... Um, a turn down and offer uh, to appear on the heat on CGTN again tonight. But that was a time commitment because I, I couldn't, it was at the same time that I'm going to be speaking to y'all and I couldn't do it. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm working on doing that. But, but today is one of those days when it's just kind of hard. It's been kind of hard to do that because I, I, you know, I worked and I did the show, uh, had to pick up some printouts for, uh, a tabling we're doing at the Latin American and Caribbean uh, 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 summit uh, policy summit tomorrow at American University. Black Alliance for Peace has a table there. Uh, we're going to be um, uh, uh, listening to uh, folks talk about how the Monroe Doctrine is in the process of being buried in the global South right now. Uh, Dr. Jamima Pierre is coming from the West Coast here to D.C. to give a talk there. Um, we're going to uh, go out and have dinner afterward. We're going to have some fun. But there's organizing that has to be done before that. So I had to go pick up some printouts for some Zona P stuff and had to go drop them off with a comrade because I also have an appointment tomorrow morning. Um, and then I'm going to go from the appointment to the summit to dinner. And then on Sunday, uh, we've got our Black Alliance for Peace uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Meeting. <sighs> yeah. So, yeah. So I, I, I dropped the materials off with my comrade. And then I got on a call with the Filipino organizer to talk about um, uh, Filipino nurses and um, African diasporic nurses and hospital staff trying to organize. Um and <laughs> just got off that call, threw some makeup on my face to keep from, you know, shining up the joint, put some lipstick on and hopped on with you. So, y'all, y'all pray my strength because I, I don't know how I'm not sure how this is going to work out, this whole relaxing thing. Um, but anyway, here we are. Here we are. Thank you all for joining me. And I see that more folks have come in 40 j blaze good to see you big teal manny nile ricky ryan toby keontae sealy uh eric berkeley let me go down let me go down thank you all thank you all so much for joining me so let's get to 
our discussion. Yeah, I don't know how I do it either, man. It, man, I, I, people ask me how all the time. People really do ask me this. Oh my God, how do you do this? And then this is, I'm doing all this at like I have always, because this is how I've always operated before I was deep into organizing. This is how I operated when I was just, you know, active in my church. I, this was, I've always been busy. I've always liked to be deeply engaged in whatever it is I believe in. Um, so yeah. And so now it, it's, it's so stressful because I'm, I'm, I'm throwing four hours, four days a week of dialysis treatment into this mix, thinking that I cannot change anything. And my body is slapping me around like, Heffa, <sighs> you doing too much. So uh, yeah, I'm definitely, definitely going to pull back on something. Although right now I'm not really sure what that something is going to be. But anyway, so let's, let's get to talking about, um, Let's get into our topics because I felt like um, a couple of things that have happened in the past week or so um, have been a an, an exposure of the U.S. government uh, really ramping up repression against uh, efforts of Africans and Pan-Africanists in particular um, toward greater internationalism, right? And taken by themselves, I think these issues could be seen as not at all related, but I think they're very related. And I think um, after I looked into these issues a little bit more, um, I think that we, we need to redouble our efforts. Uh, to declare our Pan-Africanism uh, unapologetically and to be clear about what kind of Pan-Africanists we are, that we are the anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, socialist-leaning Pan-Africanists specifically, and that we are not just cultural Pan-African Pan-Africanists who run around with the, you know, African uh, aesthetic, but without the politics that facilitate actual Pan-African liberation in unity. So this is what I'm talking about. So we were talking on the uh, Remix Morning Show earlier this week, I think, uh, that Chad nationalized its um, oil assets. So we talked about this earlier and this was, it was a little kind of celebratory, but, but I kind of thought about the fact that, you know, Chad, the people in Chad have been um, opposing the government in Chad since about October of last year, because the government in Chad uh, has not implemented a democratic transition uh, from the, um, uh, uh, from from the son of the former leader of Chad being killed a few years ago, just stepping into the role and and not. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. But so Chad, we were talking about this in the, on the Remix Morning Show, how Chad nationalized its assets that were owned by Exxon Mobil, and and on the face of it, this is a good thing. Um, however. And and so let, let me get into this a little bit. Chad, this is obviously reported by Al Jazeera. They said that Chad has nationalized all assets and rights, including hydrocarbon permits and exploration and production authorizations that belong to a subsidiary of ExxonMobil, the West African nation's energy and hydrocarbons ministry said in a statement. Uh, and this was Thursday, March 24th that they made this statement. ExxonMobil said in December, 2022, that it had closed the sale of its operations in Chad and Cameroon to London listed Savannah Energy in a $40.7 million deal. But the Chadian government contested the agreement saying the final terms were different from what had been presented to it. 
uh, the, uh, the, the, the government of Chad argued that somebody, either Exxon Mobil or uh, uh, Savannah Energy, um, presented a bait and switch and presented something different in the final terms than what they were initially presented, if I'm reading that correctly. The government warned when that happened that it may ask the courts to block Savannah's purchase of Exxon's assets in the country and take further steps to protest to protect its interests. Exxon's assets included a 40% stake in Chad Doba, Chad's Doba oil project which comprises seven producing oil fields with a combined output of 28,000 barrels per day. It also included Exxon's interest in the more than 1,000 kilometer, 621 mile Chad Cameroon pipeline from the landlocked nation to the Atlantic Gulf of Guinea coast through which its crude is exported. Exxon Mobil was not available for comment. Savannah said it plans to pursue all its legal rights to contest Chad's move. Uh, to nationalize the assets. Um, they said the, af the actions of the Republic of Chad are in direct breach of the conventions to which SCI and the Republic of Chad are amongst other parties. They said they were going to go to the ICC, take Chad to the ICC court, blah, blah, blah. But basically what it boils down to is Chad said, no, we don't like how you all switched whatever it was that you switched. We're taking over the oil assets. And on the surface, that, that's a good thing. However, when we consider that in Chad, the people have been rising up against the current, who is supposed to be an interim president, <clears throat> the government of Chad nationalizing oil interests takes on a different character. So let's talk about that for a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is um, a characterization of uh, Chad's current, supposed to be interim president um, uh, by uh, published in Foreign Policy Magazine. Foreign Policy Magazine, definitely not uh, an independent Pan-African revolutionary publication, but they can be surprisingly neutral in presenting all of the facts, or at least most of the facts uh, in, in regard to uh, some foreign policy. So they point out that the current interim president of Chad, they call him a coup leader, um, and the government of Chad is a transitional government. And they say that he stops democracy in his tracks. And this is who they are talking about. The interim president, Mahamat Idris Debi, who is the son of the former president of Chad. Let's go down here and get into this um, article. In October, uh, uh, in April, 2021, Former President Idris Deby was killed in uh, uh, some military conflict. Um, people called it a coup because the people didn't Chad didn't like him because he was a despot. Uh, so October 20 of last year was meant to be the end of Chad's political transition after the death of long-term President Idris Deby in April 2021. Opposition groups and civil society instead took to the streets to protest the continued denial of democracy, and then things got worse, is what Foreign Policy Magazine says. This is what happened. Chadians have begun to refer to October 20 as Black Thursday. In addition to mass arrests, scores of pro-democracy demonstrators were killed and injured in some of the worst repression in the country's history. Images posted on social media show bodies covered in the country's tricolor flag. Among the casualties that day was journalist Ored J. Narcisse, who witnesses said was shot and killed in front of his home by people in military attire. So... Foreign Policy Magazine goes on to give a little bit of the backdrop of how of how the country got here. Immediately after Idris Deby's death, 
a military junta led by his son, Mahamat Idris Debbi, seized control of the country. The Transitional Military Council suspended the constitution. That's always a bad sign. Unless the constitution was written by like a literal former dictator. Um, but if you're the son of the former dictator, I guess odds are that you're really not going to do better than your father. <laughs> and he did not. He seized control of the country, the son did, suspended the constitution, but committed to oversee an 18-month transition period that would end with a transition to civilian rule via elections. He promised that he would have elections. Instead, what he did was Chad, Chad, uh, got a, a two-year extension of the transition. The son, Mahamat Idris Debi, extended the transition period to two years, um, swore himself in as president, um, uh, uh, made the junta eligible to run in future elec uh, elections, and the repression of the people who rose up against all that, that became Black Thursday. Uh, the, the extension of his rule and the violent crackdown on those who opposed it um, was marked in a speech that Idris uh, Muhammad, let me call him Mahab, Muhammad, Muhammad Debi, in a speech that Muhammad Debi made after Black Thursday, in which he blamed the organizers of the protest for the violence. And that was a signal that democracy wasn't coming to Chad anytime soon under this dude. Uh, so Foreign Policy Magazine says that Mahamat, like his father, evades retribution thanks to Chad's reputation as a bulwark of stability in an increasingly insecure Sahel reason, region, boasting one of the most powerful militaries in the region. And this is very important. Chad has long been a key partner in international security strategies, including France's Operation Barkhane the United Nations-backed counterterrorism G5 Sahel Joint Force, the UN's multidimensional integrated stabilization mission in Mali, and the multinational joint task force created to fight Boko Haram. So the father, Idris Debi, was uh, basically a, a, uh, a vassal, uh, uh, allowed Chad to be a vassal state, of France, the United Nations, and to some degree, the the and obviously to the United States, and the son Mahamat Debi continues with that, and these are the things that the people are angry about not not just the denial of elections, but the fact that this relationship that keeps Chad in locked in a relationship with France, NATO, the UN and the United States, the people in Chad don't want that anymore. So let me scroll down and see if I highlighted any more in this article. I did not. I'm going to drop it in the chat for you, though, so you can read it for yourself. <clears throat> there you go. So when we think about um, that government in Chad, um nationalizing the oil assets in the country, then it becomes something that I'm, I'm hesitant to celebrate because I don't trust this guy, Mahamat Debi, to share the wealth of that nationalization of those oil resources with the people in the country. I mean, if he would turn the military on the people who protested uh, him extending the transition period with no elections after suspending the constitution, if he would turn the military on people for that, I don't trust that he's going to share the profits of the nationalizing of the oil industry of Chad with the people, all right? So that puts that in a different light. I'm glad ExxonMobil is not getting <laughs> the licenses and I'm glad that this other country, this London country, co a company, uh, Savannah, whatever it is, I'm glad they're not getting the revenue from uh, uh, ExxonMobil but uh, yeah, I'm wondering what 
Muhammad Debbie is going to do with those resources. All right. <sighs> so let me go into the chat. I don't, I, I want to make sure I get you all's comments as we're going along in this conversation and I need to catch my breath. <laughs> oh my gosh. So let's see. Yes. I'm so glad you all brought up this. I try not to, to cut into Kim's show, which comes on at seven o'clock uh, too much. But so I just can't, we just can't, can't help that. Cause I, I can't get home sooner than to get this to get on here by six o'clock. So I, I, I hate cutting into her show, but she does have an amazing disability support group uh, for folks and for caregivers. Uh, they do uh, do, she does a show for them once a month. It's fantastic. Uh, so I, I encourage people to, to avail themselves of that and support Kim, uh, burn it down uh, with Kim Brown that comes on at seven o'clock on Fridays and in the middle of the week. Also, uh, thanks so much, Eric. I'm glad that you like this is, I was really, I was really glad to learn this context and to be careful because I always want to be careful that I'm, I'm paying attention to what the people in a country are saying and doing, saying about and doing in response to their government. And I remember Abdus and I going to a protest at the Chadian embassy, embassy, uh, 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 at the French embassy here in Washington D.C. in 2018, where they were demanding that France get the hell out of Chad. Then, um, and and I, I just I, I remember like reading the uh, th just thinking about the the story about Chad nationally nationalizing their oil, and thinking, oh well, wait a minute. The chat. What what are the people in Chad saying? That I remembered this horrible massacre in October, and I thought, let me look some more into this. And I'm glad I found, you know, found this additional context that does make this a very different kind of thing. All right. So, so now let me scroll down, scroll down a little bit more. Cool. So now. Let's get into why this is, I think what's going on in Chad is an attack on internationalism and Pan-Africanism in particular. Because if you've noticed, oh, I got to sign into my Wall Street Journal article. Sorry. Can I do it here? Oh, it just loves to take its time. There we go. So I read the Wall Street Journal, so you don't have to. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I, I have a habit of using for a lot of my initial references, um, not necessarily revolutionary sources, because I want people to get into the habit of actually reading the articles to see the contradictions that the imperialist rags uh, uh, willingly put. They just put the whole contradictions and the lies and, you know, they contradict themselves all the time in these articles and how to analyze what comes out of the empire for the truth, because it is possible to do that even with their propaganda. So this article was published in the Wall Street Journal uh, it was a Wall Street Journal news exclusive uh, in February of this year with the claim that U.S. intelligence points to a Wagner, a Wagner, that's really how you pronounce it, I think, plot against key Western ally in Africa. Who's the key Western ally in Africa? Chad. All right. So they were saying back in February that officials have been sharing information that Chad uh, that Russia, that Russia's Wagner group is, was plotting to overthrow Mahamat Debi in Chad and may have had a hand in the uh, death of the father, Idris Debi. <laughs> All right. So let, let's go into, let me see if I can. Yes. Got my highlights. 
down here in the article, you read the, you know, the first couple of, of, of uh, paragraphs. And then the first thing that jumped out to me um, was that the Biden administration and European governments that are deeply involved in Chad, because I just told you that they were and how they were, um, have been pushing leaders in Africa to stop working with the Wagner group. Now, I think that's funny because the United States government doesn't have a problem with African nations working with Blackwater and every other U.S. Uh, um, contractor, militia, or mercenary group that they can send there. The U.S. government has no problem with U.S. mercenary groups working with African leaders. But they don't like African leaders working with the Wagner group. The article goes on to say the U.S. Treasury Department last month, that would be in January 2023, designated uh, Wagner as a transnational criminal organization over its actions in combat operations in Ukraine on behalf of Russia. Let's not forget that the Azov Battalion and none of the fascist right-wing forces, neo-Nazi forces that are legitimized and incorporated into the Ukrainian army and the police throughout the country, they're not recognized. They are not designated by the Tre Treasury Department as criminal organizations or terrorist groups, but the Wagner group is. Just wanted to point that out. The Treasury said Wagner personnel are also involved in alleged criminal activity, including mass executions, rape, and physical abuse in the Central African Republic in Mali, uh, echoing ac accusations made by human rights groups and locals. Now, I'm not going to discount what Africans say about foreign entities and what they do to them. But I don't trust what the empire says about what these groups, I don't. I need to hear this from Africans. And we know that within all groups of oppressed people, there are uh, compradors and accomplices and uh, um, folks who collude with the enemy. So I'm taking this with a grain of salt, but I'm not just completely dismissing it because I hate the Wall Street Journal. That's just, okay, I'm just saying that. So the Wall Street Journal says that uh, Mr. DeB, I, I, I hate how they, they call everybody by these proper titles. And, 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 the, and uh, the New York Times does this too. They, and I think they do it in, in, in a way to, I, I, I actually don't know why they do it. It's annoying. Like they call everybody Mr. This and Mrs. That. You know, they give them these formal titles as, as if that's like a, a, a very proper and um, a cultured way to present the news. It's, it's, it just annoys me. That's just my pet peeve. But they say that Debbie became Chad's president in April 2021 after his father, Idris Debbie, was killed in battle by a Chadian rebel group that had also been stationed alongside Wagner mercenaries in Libya. Hmm. <laughs> they go on to say that Chad under Mr. Debbie and his father has worked closely with France and the U.S. in the war against the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda affiliates in the Sahel region. The majority Muslim country, they're talking about Chad, hosts U.S. Special Forces and drones and its own soldiers have been deployed to fight jihadist groups in neighboring Nigeria, Cameroon, and Niger, where other local mil mil uh, militaries have struggled. Within Chad, however, there have been protests against Mr. Debbie's ascent to power after his father's death, which did not follow the line of succession outlined in the Constitution that he uh, uh, suspended and extended his family's more than three decade long rule of the country, one of the world's poorest. Chad is one of the world's poorest countries. So again, this guy nationalizing the oil reserves in Chad, I'm not really confident that those proceeds are gonna make their way down to the people. I'm willing to be wrong. Some of those protests have also targeted France, 
accusing the government of President Emmanuel Macron, who attended the elder Mr. Debbie's funeral, that's how close they were, y'all, of prioritize, prioritizing its influence in the region over human rights and democracy. And then this article does something really different, did, uh, interesting. It goes into this accusation that Wagner has been plotting an over, uh, a, a coup against Debbie. Uh, so they say France has previously urged Chadian authorities to hold elections and criticize the government for the deadly repression of protests that followed uh, the October announcement by Chad's junta that elections would be delayed for two more years. The junta said the delay was agreed to as part of a national dialogue with opposing parties, but not all opposing parties were included in those talks. That's a problem. In a recording circulated on social media in February 2022, Timon Erdimi, the leader of a Chadian rebel group called Union des Forces Republicains, asked Abdul Qasim Algoni Tijani, then a special adv advisor to the president of the Central African Republic, uh, President Faustin Ashans Tusad, to, I'm sorry, Tuadera, to, to that's it, yeah, Tuadera, to, to convince Russians to come to Chad to drive out Mahamat Debbie and France, all right? This is what this recording said. Um, the leader of the Chadian rebel group, Union of Republican Forces, asked the special advisor to the president of the Central African, uh, the, asked the, uh, the special advisor to Chad to convince the Russians to come to Chad uh, to drive out Mahamat Debbie and France. This was not anyone in Russia saying, let's coup the government in Chad. This was not uh, uh, the leader of Wagner saying, let's coup the government, let's kill uh, uh, Papa Idris Debi and let's uh, coup son Mahamat Debi. This is one of the Chadian, uh, uh, the leader of the Chadian rebels, the Union of Republican Forces asking for Russia to come in to get rid of Debbie, all right? And he's not even asking um, Wagner. He's asking another African leader to, could you please ask them to come? That's the context of these accusations. So then they go on to say um, that... And this this is where the Wall Street and, and I, I I keep reading the article and I'm looking for where there is a conversation that somebody in Russia said, yes, we received this request from the uh, Chadian rebel leader and I'm, we're sending Wagner in to, to coup Mahamat Debi. I'm waiting for that and I don't see it. What I see instead in this Wall, Wall Street Journal article from February is this. Um. They say that, but the American and African officials interviewed for this article <clears throat> said the current U.S. intelligence relied on new separate evidence of joint plans by Wagner and Chadian rebels to destabilize the country. I'm still waiting for the plans, but they said this. When you combine the killing of Mr. Debbie's father, Idris Debi, with what we're seeing today, a pretty clear picture of a connected, persistent uh, Prigozhin Wagner plan to destabilize the transitional government of Chad emerges, the senior US official says. I didn't get a clear picture of that at all from this article. I didn't, I kept thinking, what am I missing? I'm not so sure what's going on. And I went back up and I went to see what was I looking for? Did I miss something? I'm not sure. I'm going to give you all this article because maybe you're going to find something that I missed. But I know they didn't put anything in that article that I actually pointed to. <laughs> So <clears throat> they do say in this article uh, that uh, uh, Prigozhin, uh, and I think, where, where was when, uh, Prigozhin is the, um, uh, where, where, where is it, where is it, where is it? 
uh, uh, Yevgeny, Yevgeny, sorry, Yevgeny Prigozhin is, uh, they call him a Russian oligarch, probably is, and he is the leader of Wagner. And they're saying in the article that he is actively planning to destabilize the Chadian tra transition government and offered Chadian rebels material and operational support to execute a plot, which may include plans to eliminate uh, Chadian transition president Mahamat Idris Debi in order to seize control of the government of Chad. But nothing in this article pointed to any such thing. Uh, when they asked Prigozhin for a comment, he declined to comment on the allegations. He had previously denied that Russian fighters were involved in massacres and other abuses in Africa and elsewhere. The Wall Street Journal article says that companies run by Mr. Prigozhin have also been given licenses to mine gold, including in Sudan and in the Central African Republic, handing him access to precious resources at a time when uh, Wagner Group mercenaries are a central force in Russia's war in Ukraine. I, what is that supposed to mean? Like, is, is that supposed to be the smoking gun? That means that Wagner Group is trying to coup uh, the government, the transitional government in Chad, because if that's the case, then France is just as likely to be plotting a coup of the trans transitional government in France, as is London, as is the United States, because don't they all have access to licenses and uh, to 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 mine resources in Ch oh come on and 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 in Sudan and in the Central African Republic yes they do so merely the fact that the head of the Wagner group has mining licenses in Sudan and in the Central African Republic the Wall Street Journal article are making that seem like that's some reason that he is uh, that's one of the reasons or one of the smoking gun that guns that points to this Wagner plot to overthrow uh, uh, um, uh, Mahamat Debi. Nah, I'm not buying that. That's not good enough. And I think the state realized real that that wasn't good enough because lo and behold, y'all, it's amazing how it just happened that the Washington Post just a few days ago, publishes this article, a Russian plot against Chad concerns mount over important U.S. ally. And this is coming from this uh, these Discord leaks, uh, these documents that are leaked on Discord. <sighs> so let's, so I had to read through this. And these are the people who are protesting the deep, the, the Deby government in Chad. <sighs> okay. The Washington Post now is saying that these documents that have been leaked uh, on the Discord sir, from the Discord server describe an effort by Russia's paramilitary Wagner group in February. They're talking about the same thing that the Wall Street Journal reported in February to recruit Chadian rebels and establish a training site for 300 fighters in the neighboring Central African Republic as part of an evolving plot to topple the Chadian government. So, so our so they're saying that because Wagner is establishing a training site for 300 fighters in the Central African Republic, that is an indication that they are uh, uh, engaging, that they are cooking up a plot to topple the Chadian government. But if that, if merely recruiting Chadian rebels and training them in another country is an indication that Wagner is plotting to topple the Deby government, then wouldn't that also mean that the United Nations, France, uh, NATO, and the United States with all of their military operations inside Chad could also be looked at as those entities cooking up a plot? <laughs> this whole... These accusations, look, I'm not sitting here being an apologist for Russia's mil mercenary group, but, but a couple of things I think need to be made clear here. Wagner has not gone anywhere that they have not been invited to go. You feel me? On the continent of Africa, 
Vladimir Putin, nobody in the Kremlin, nobody has sent Wagner or any other Russian military, paramilitary, mercenary group to an African nation without the express invitation of that African nation. They're not sitting there saying, we don't like what's going on in Chad. Let's send our military there to fix this mess. Where Wagner is on the continent, they were invited. That's the first thing. Um, second, <laughs> African nations have every right to choose who they want to align with in ironing out their affairs. If after how many decades since 2011, since the war on terror was launched by the United States, many African nations have seen since the expansion of AFRICOM ostensibly to fight the war on terrorism and the spread of Islamic jihadist terrorism on the continent that didn't actually solve the problem or stop terrorism. It actually increased terrorism on the continent by over 1000%. African nations are realizing that their relationships with the United States, the US military, France, its military, the United Nations and their military and NATO has not benefited them. It has not brought their countries the stability and the peace and the prosperity that those entities promised that their engagement with them would bring. So now these African nations are like, I don't, we don't want to fuck with y'all no more. Cause all y'all do is come in here. You tell us what to do. You, you, and, and you kill our people. And it's wild because these decisions to turn away from um, uh, uh, a blind allegiance to the U.S. and to seek assistance from Russia and China, these decisions are being made by African leaders who aren't even pan-Africanist and revolutionary, y'all. Some of these people are straight up compradors. And in this guy's case, in Davey's case, uh, <laughs> well, he's not asking for... Uh, um, uh, Wagner to come in and help, I don't think. But as as I pointed out in the other article, the uh, uh, the resistance to Debbie's government in Chad, they're asking for Wagner to come in. So that's the other thing. So so my position is not in defense of Wagner or in defense of Russia. My position is to point out the hypocrisy of US imperialist policy, the this kind of, it's good when we do it, it's called democracy and nation building when we do it, but when another country does it, oh, it's a plot to overthrow a government, stop that. Oh my God. So here's where they claim that they have information from Wagner's leader, again, uh, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, um, where they claim that uh, uh, there was a detailed discussion earlier that month between Prigozhin and his associates about the timeline and facility. And they say for training an initial group of rebels in Avakaba that's close to the Chadian border and the route that Wagner would use to transport them. So I'm, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading down. Um, they say in this article, the debate of, over how far the U.S. can push Chad and whether this could jeopardize the U.S.'s security interests in Africa, which is resources, its resources is resources, exemplifies the challenges facing Western foreign policymakers who seek to support allied governments. Remember, Debbie is an ally to the United States, just like his father was, and also advance democratic values, In quotes. Analysts say that Russia's campaign to project greater influence in Africa has raised the stakes. And they also, you know, they always make this claim that Russia projecting greater influence is this evil, nefarious thing. There's all oh, the big Russian bear is coming in, stomping in, projecting his evil influence in Africa. But the United States has waged a bloody, bloody campaign against quote unquote terrorism that has actually caught up 
hundreds of thousands, if not millions of civilians on the continent of Africa that has been more brutal than anything Russia has done. So I just, just the hypocrisy is ridiculous. Hmm. In a sharply worded letter to, to the sec to Secretary of State Anthony Blinken last month, hmm, Senator Robert Menendez, Democrat of New Jersey, from New Jersey, who is also chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, wrote that he was extremely concerned by the lack of clear public U.S. response to the October killings, in addition to continued U.S. support for Chad's military that is now the transitional government. The risk, Menendez wrote in the letter, which has not previously been reported, this is very interesting that this was even reported, is creating a perception that the United States is willing to partner with regimes that do not respect democracy and human rights as long as such regi regimes agree to cooperate on countering terrorism and opposing malign influence uh, malign Russian influence. Oh my God, he's just said the quiet part of US foreign policy in Africa out loud. And really it's, that, is, that is the basis of US foreign policy, not just in Africa, but all around the world. That is US foreign policy. We don't care what you do in your country as long as you oppose Russia and China on our behalf. That he, Menendez said the quiet part out. I'm surprised they published that. Every once in a while, I told you, you have to read the sources of the empire because every once in a while they will trip up and tell the truth. So I go on and I'm still looking for this evidence. I'm looking and then, okay, here we get to this thing. Ooh, the plot to topple Chad's government. And I'm like, all right, now we're going to see it. I'm reading, I'm reading a terrible picture of Chad and, and Macron. So they say that President Idris Deby uh, they talk about how he was fatally wounded on the battlefield in 2021. He tamped down multiple rebellions during his 30 year reign. People ain't like him either. Sometimes with the support of Chad's former colonizer, I cannot believe the Washington Post actually called France the former colonizer. France, <laughs> but they did it. Chad has been led by Debbie's son. Yeah, okay, we talked about that. What has changed is Russia, Russia's involvement, which has expanded in Africa as France's popularity has fallen. Uh, and I remember specifically uh, at the, at the uh, French embassy um, stomping on the French flag with the Chadians outside of the French embassy, and it was fantastic time. Uh, a Western diplomat in Chad, who like other diplomats, spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss sensitive foreign policy issues, said that Chad faces the possibility of an internal coup in addition to threats from rebels based just over its border in Libya, Sudan, and the Central African Republic. The Wagner paramilitary group has ties with armed forces or militias in each of these countries. Again, I must note that any ties that Wagner has with any groups in these countries, they were invited in, okay? So I'm still reading because I'm looking for the evidence and then they finally get to this. The leaked U.S. intelligence documents say the efforts to foment a rebellion in Chad are part of a broader push by Prigozhin to create a, here it is, unified confederation of African states across the breadth of the continent, including Burkina Faso, Chad, Eritrea, Guinea, Mali, Niger, and Sudan. During the last year, Gojin has accelerated Wagner operations in Africa, shifting his approach from taking advantage of security vacuums to intentionally facilitating instability, one document says. Now, while this still is not evidence of Wagner and, excuse me, Gojin in particular cooking up a plot, what this is evidence of is the U.S. government terrified of this. This is what the United States government is terrified of. This is what this whole Wagner and their Russian growing influence in, in, in Africa, Russia is cooking up a, chew, a coup in Chad. Uh, uh, Russia is expanding its influence on the continent. That, this right here, the unified confederation of African states 
across the continent of Africa, this is what the U.S. government is terrified of. This is what the U.S. government and its European former colonizing allies have always been terrified of. And this to me is evidence that they're still terrified of it. So let me, uh, um, I'm going to give this article to you, but let me, let me look in the chat because I want to get, I want to get y'all's comments. I want y'all to come on now. Cause this, when I saw this, I was like, Ooh, delivering the confirmation revolutionary Brown Palestinian Jesus. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Ricky. I do. Ooh, it's just, I love it. I love it when the revolutionary plan comes together. Because it always does. The information always really is out there. The empire really does not hide their intentions. They really will tell you exactly what it is they're afraid of and what it is they're doing right in their own shit. You just got to read it and you just got to know how to read it. So, okay, let me go up and let me see what you all have to say. Hmm. Oh my God, y'all don't have a, y'all have not been having a side conversation. You mean to tell me you have been listening attentively to all this? I am so tickled. This is great. <laughs> so, okay, let me not delay. Let me not delay then. Yes, indeed. Yes, ma'am. That's what this, oh, dialectical materialism is like a warm, soft blanket for revolutionary. That's what this is. All right, so let's let let me not delay. Let me continue. I'm I get to this and I'm just like, oh, so 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 the government, the US government, they're still afraid of us. They're literally still afraid of us, y'all. Oh, <sighs> but I'm still looking for evidence. There's there's still no evidence of a Russian plot. So I'm still looking, I'm still reading. I'm still reading and I, I'm reading and I'm, I'm going to read you exactly what they say. I didn't highlight it, but this is what they say. They go into the discord leaks. They go on to say the documents in these leaks are part of a trove of images of classified files posted on discord, a group chat service popular with gamers, allegedly by a member of the Massachusetts Air National Guard. Chadian intelligence believed that two Chadian nationals traveled in late February to Bangui. I hope that's pronounced correctly. The capital of the Central African Republic at Wagner's invitation to again help recruit fighters from Chad and the Central African Republic in a Wagner-funded plot to destabilize the Chadian regime, according to the documents. Uh, the two Chadian national nationals who are named in the documents stayed at uh, the fancy hotel where they reportedly re were received by Defense Minister Ramon Claude Biro of the Central African Republic, which has been engaged with Wagner. They invited Wagner, Wagner to come in since 2018. As part of the effort, the two Chadian nationals were working with the Central African Republic government to persuade rebels specifically of Southern Chadian origin, origin to work alongside Wagner, the doctors say. Contacted for comment, <laughs> I do love this. This is why I, love, I highlighted this. Prigozhin, the, the leader, the head of Wagner, replied with obscenities. He probably said, fuck y'all motherfuckers. What the fuck you keep asking me about this shit for? I told you. Because mm, that's what I would have said. And said the reports about his involvement with a planned, re a planned rebellion in Chad were nonsense. <laughs> I don't mean to put words in the dude's mouth, but that's what I would have said. <laughs> Along with y'all ain't got shit. <laughs> Because I keep reading this article and I find, I don't find, I don't find. Goes on to say, Chadian Communications Minister Aziz Mahamat Saleh did not specifically address the U.S. intelligence information, but said in an interview in N'Djamena, uh, a Chadian publication this month, that the government is aware that many young people have Chad, many young people from Chad have joined Wagner in the Central African Republic. Salah said, I'm sorry, Saleh said his country does not have problems with Russia, 
but cannot accept apparent efforts by Wagner to interfere with Chad's internal politics. Let's stop right there. <clears throat> the Chadian communications minister said that Chad doesn't have a problem with Russia. But of course they wouldn't accept any outside, uh, any other group to interfere with Chad's internal politics, even though they are absolutely allowing the United States government and France and the UN and NATO to interfere, <laughs> to interfere in Chad's, okay, fine. But okay, he said, he's saying they don't have a problem with Russia. He said that Wagner has turned up in other African countries when their governments needed help in holding on to power when their governments asked ask Wagner to come in and help, which he said will not be the case in Chad. We can defend ourselves. So he's literally saying we, we, we don't have anything to defend ourselves against Chad over. We don't. We don't, uh, we don't, uh, against uh, Wagner, rather. We're not, what is this? No. The Central African Republic's communication minister did not respond to requests for comment because I guess maybe that person is like, man, don't involve me in this bullshit. <laughs> in February, the Wall Street, Re Street Journal reported that the United States shared intelligence with authorities in Chad, indicating that Wagner has potentially planned to assassinate Day B., I keep reading the article. I keep reading the article. <sighs> a spokesman for U.S. Africa Command. Why the hell the interloper in Africa gets a say in all of this? I don't know, but they do. A spokesman for the U.S. Africa Command, which oversees military operations on the continent. That's why they get a say. Because let's be clear, if you weren't clear before about what U.S. Africa, the U.S. Africa Command or AFRICOM as we call it is, it is the operation through the U.S. military that oversees all military operations on the continent of Africa. That's why they get a say in the internal operations in Chad. So a spokesman for U.S. Africa, uh, 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 Africa Command said Chad has been, quote, a very willing, willing and capable partner in fighting terrorism. Hmm. So they talk about uh, the uprising, the people's uprising against uh, Deby, both both Debis, but the 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 son. They say tensions were already running high when thousands of pro-democracy protesters took to the streets in Njama, Jamina on October 20 to oppose a government plan to extend its hold on power for another two years. Security forces responded by firing tear gas and live ammunition at protesters, chasing them into homes and arresting hundreds. It was the bloodiest day in Chad in decades. Um, a, uh, a Chadian human rights lawyer who shielded people at her house said people are living with fear. We don't know what will happen in the next minute. And the international community has been too quiet. And the United States was quiet about this. The United States government and AFRICOM that said that Chad had been such a willing and fantastic and great and wonderful partner didn't say shit about the Chadian government under Mahamat Debi slaughter, slaughtering Chad and Chadian people not a peep. And this, the fact that the U.S. government said nothing about this was brought up in this article. Surprised that they brought it up, but they did. That day marked a turning point. Another Western diplomat said, noting that any hope that Debbie might be more open to democracy than his father had been dashed. All of us are losing trust and hope, he said. <clears throat> Let's see, but a Western dis uh, diplomat added that a decision by Chad's government to expel an outspoken German ambassador this month, citing his discourteous attitude, sent a clear message to the rest of the diplomatic community that if you criticize them, you're out. And then they go into talking about silence over the security force killings. The Biden administration has never condemned Debbie's seizure of power, which is a coup. 
the letter from Menendez, they bring this up again, noted, and invited, and in, in, and in fact, this guy, Debbie, was one of the African leaders who was vi invited to Washington for that bullshit Washington uh, Africa, U.S. Africa Leader Summit last year. Didn't say, the Biden administration said nothing about the Chadian people killed. So, of course, Chad continues, not Chad, Debbie, the son, continues to do what he does in Chad because he's been allowed to by the forces, the Western, the U.S., the international forces that prop it, his government up. And, and his attitude is, well, don't talk about my human rights, rights abuses and I'll keep letting you do what you want to do in Chad. Okay. And that's the end of the article, y'all. That's it. That's so. So now I'm going to share this article with you because I, I need for you to read this article and see if you see what I missed in finding the evidence from these discord leaks that point to the Wagner group plotting a coup to overthrow Mahamat Debi in Chad. I'm sorry, but I don't see it. I didn't see it. I didn't see it in the article that the Wall Street Journal posted in uh, uh, published in, in February. I didn't see it in that article from the Washington Post from the Discord leaks. I Where's the plot? Let me tell you where the plot is. It doesn't exist. Now, I don't doubt for one second that opposition groups within Chad are trying to get rid of Debbie. Don't doubt it for a second. But that does not mean that this is Pregosian's plot that this is Wagner's plot, that this is Russia's plot. No, this is the people in Chad wanting to get rid of this dude. And, and I don't even know if that's actually happening. So I can't even say for sure that that is happening. I know that there are opposition groups to Debbie's regime. I know that the Wall Street Journal article said that there was the leader of one of the opposition groups who asked, the uh, uh, an official in the Central African Republic, please get a message to Wagner to please come and help us. That's it. There is no evidence that Prigozhin or anyone from Wagner received such a request <laughs> and responded favorably to such a request. Two articles, no evidence. So, so all of this, all of this, all of this, this uh, narrative from the state about a Russian plot to overthrow the government in Chad, it is not about an actual Wagner plot to overthrow the government in Chad. It is literally about the US and the European nation's fear of a unified confederation of African states. That's what they're terrified of. They see African nations turning away, as I said before, a little earlier, from their blind devotion to U.S. policy and military support, and uh, I can't even say it's guidance, it's, it's, you know, control, and deciding to cast their lot with Russia and China. And not only deciding to cast their lot with Russia and China, because something that Russia and China, particularly China, is doing is facilitating ways for Russian, for African nations to um, engage with each other in ways that the US and the former colonial powers of Africa discouraged The Western imperialist forces never wanted a unified Africa. They never wanted African nations to negotiate with, trade with, be in a block together with each other to operate on behalf of 
each other's shared interests. And they're terrified that this is happening right now because it is. But it's not happening because Wagner is leading it. It's not happening because Russia is leading it. It's not happening because China is leading it. It's happening because Africa is leading it. So the narratives that you are going to continue seeing about this Wagner plot to coup Debbie and Chad um, is really a signal to us, we Pan-Africanists, that the U.S. frowns upon our efforts to unite with our African brothers and sisters to be engaged in Pan-Africanism. Because I, I can't, of course, there will be sanctions. This, this is going to be the excuse for the United States to impose more sanctions on Wagner. Um, if Chad, if the Chadian government does not respond to this cooked up Wagner threat in the way that the U.S. government wants it to, and I, I, can't, I can't predict what that would be, um, then the United States will begin to um, impose sanctions on Chad, which will make the economic situation in Chad worse. And then the U.S. government is probably going to, to, to foment a coup in Chad to get rid of Debbie to make way for another leader who will be more amenable to doing the U.S.'s and AFRICOM's bidding. But all of this, all of this is to keep Pan-Africanism from being realized on the African continent and throughout the diaspora because Pan-Africanism, global Pan-Africanism still terrifies the hell out of the empire. And that's why I'm a motherfucking Pan-Africanist till the day I die. If it scares the empire, that's what I am. <sighs> so, that's what that's all about. This whole Chad thing. It's not the the nationalizing the oil. It's, it's not and it's not done in isolation. I think the empire was very angry at Chad for nationalizing the oil, but they didn't cook up too. They didn't kick up too much of a fuss about that because they had this bigger threat over here of this potential unification of these African nations that they they can't see. They can't stop it. They can't stop. I know, Ricky. They, I know. I got. I got. I allowed myself to get way more excited than I should have been. But, but I'm sorry. I'm. I'm as dangerous a moment as we are in right now. I'm. I'm excited. I am excited because we, I believe, are that much closer to the multipolar multipolar world that we need. And we are that much closer to a unified Africa under Pan-Africanism and scientific socialism than I think even we realize. That does not mean that we will not get there through some struggle, some wars, and some blood. Oh, there will be a war in Chad. It's coming. It's coming. And Sudan and the Central African Republic and all of the Niger. Yes, they're going to be Burkina Faso is going to give because the United States is going to unleash AFRICOM on all of these nations that are trying to actively realize this Pan-African Union. That is going to happen. I believe it will. But I also believe we will prevail. Because as I said, African nations are turning away, even, even the Comprador leaders, even the leaders who are not even revolutionary are turning away from being vassal states of the United States and are at least listening to what China and Russia have to offer, which is always a lot more than what the U.S. has to offer. So that's what I think is going on with this whole 
<clears throat> Russian plot to foment a coup in Chad. It's not. I don't believe there is a Russian pl plot to foment, foment a coup in Chad. I, but I think that Russian leaders' refusal to continue to do the U.S.'s beating, a bidding will facilitate some U.S.-backed coups in some African nations in the months and years to come. So we're going to have to keep looking at that. And I do think this actually is related to this uh, case involving uh, Pross. And I know it seems weird. I know it seems weird and disconnected and it doesn't make sense, but but stick with me, man. <laughs> it just, I, I didn't get, the connections myself either until I really looked into um, this case against Pross that I didn't even realize was a thing. And I didn't realize that it was a thing for as long as it was. Um, and, and then I kind of got to the sort of end of it. And then I realized, oh snap, this is all a thing. <laughs> So, okay, let me, let me check on y'all real quick and see what you guys to say other than, you know, reminding me to calm down. <sighs> okay. Mm. Let me see. <laughs> at, at the, hey, boss score 777. Absolutely. The West is running out of toes to shoot with it. I, what they going to do? Who else they get? How to? And, and the West is sanctioning countries that are not Russia and China because, you know, the U.S. has sanctioned Russia and China up the yin-yang. And they just like, they just shrugging that off like, okay, whatever. But other countries are now like, oh, you sanctioned us? That, that's cute. Because <laughs> China and Russia are stepping in and saying, don't worry, we got you. And other countries, India and Pakistan and, and oh, come on, man. who. Big Teal, this sounds like more U.S. threat escalation because it is. My concern is that where the U.S. claims conflict to exist where there isn't could cause real conflict. You're right because it will. Absolutely right. Very, very good for you because you, 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 you call that. <clears throat> mm. So, OK, let's see. I, it is. It is. The, the, when Malcolm was assassinated, he was assassinated when he was standing up two organizations, a religious organization that was a revolutionary religious organization and an international pan-Africanist revolutionary uh, organization. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the kind of thing that got all of our African revolutionary leaders who won their revolutions, kicked the colonizers out and began to say, okay, now let's we Africans work together and let's we Africans throughout the diaspora work together. And it's like, you know what? Nah, we can't have that. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's coming. The repression against this is coming, but they can't stop it because too many of us now, we see it right? We see it. Okay. Absolutely boss score. It's the new world is being birthed right now. We just need to catch up and we just really need to get involved in it here in the beating heart of the empire. Okay. Whew. So let's talk about pros because honestly, y'all, I, I did not know that there has been an investigation into Praz and his alleged lo political lobbying since like 2017, maybe earlier. But I didn't even know he, I didn't know he was being, being investigated at all until this week. Um, Come on, article. Come on, Wall Street Journal. Don't do that. All right. Until this week, he was convicted and I was kind of unclear on some of the details on the morning show when we talked about it. And I think he was initially charged with like 50 charges, but um, it, it, ultimately he was indicted on 10 and he was convicted on all 10 of the charges in his role in a foreign influence scheme that was tied to this um, firm called 1MDB in Malaysia. Uh, and I, I don't think I did a whole lot of highlights in here, but um, so I, I did talk about this in my monologue. So 
I'm going to stop sharing, but I'm going to share this Wall Street Journal article with you that contains some of the information that I got from my monologue and, and kind of set me on the path of, you know, down my little rabbit hole of like, what is really going on with this case? Because it's way more than just, it's way more. So basically, this case against Praz involved um, this influence, cons uh, influence peddling conspiracy back in to 2012, involving this person called Je, uh, Jo Lo, uh, this Malaysian billionaire who wanted access to the Obama campaign. Um, and the interesting thing about Jo Lo is I actually knew who he was because he is featured in a Netflix documentary called Dirty Money in an episode called The Man at the Top that's about the theft of billions of dollars from Malaysia by the former prime minister of Malaysia, Najib Razak, and his oligarchical cronies. Joe Lowe is featured in that episode, and I think it's still up on Netflix, Netflix this documentary Dirty Money. So please go watch it so you can get the context of who this guy Jolo is so, because it's very important. Um, so Jolo wanted access to the Obama campaign and Pross's uh, name is Prakazrel, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, correctly, Prakazrel Michel, uh, which is where his uh, uh, nickname Pross comes from. So Praz says that, okay, so let, let me, let me get, let me lay this out step by step. In 2012, Praz had actually bankrolled a political action committee called Black Men Vote. And I did not know he was behind that. I had no idea, but he was, he bankrolled that, that, that um, political action committee. And in the run up to the 2012 election, he told the Democratic Party official in an email that he was thinking about doing a fundraiser and looking to raise around five to $10 million. That's not unusual for a celebrity who wants to raise, you know, do a fundraiser for, you know, a, a, a politician. Not unusual at all and not, a, and not illegal. According to the investigation, a mutual friend of Praz and Lowe forwarded the email to Lowe and told him falsely that, hey, here's this fundraiser that you can contribute to since you want to contribute to the Obama campaign and being a foreigner is not a problem. That is not true. People, foreigners legally on paper. Excuse me. Ooh. <clears throat> cannot contribute to U.S. political campaigns, but it wasn't Pross who told Lowe this. It was a, a third party. It was a mutual friend of Pross and Lowe who forwarded this email to Lowe, and that's how Michelle, that's how Pross and Lowe got connected. So Lowe was, so Pross did not present to Lowe hey, I can get you the access to the Obama campaign that you want. All you have to do is contribute to my fundraiser and it's fine if you're a foreigner. That, according to, according to the investigation, that's not what happened. But the person who sent the email, who was unnamed in the sources that I read, and I think it's in that Wall Street Journal article, um, the third party who sent the email to uh, uh, Lowe he was not charged. That person wasn't charged. That person wasn't convicted of nothing. But Praz was, okay? So in his testimony, Praz admitted that Lowe gave him $20 million for what Praz said uh, was Lowe wanting a picture with the Obamas, which Lowe actually did get. It just shocked me when I saw, yes, Praz did get this guy, Joe Lowe, into the White House to get a picture with the Obamas for $20 million. So of the $20 million, Lowe gave Pross $800,000 $800, of that was allegedly 
given to the Obama campaign through what the prosecutors call straw donors, um, which they say allowed him to evade the legal limits of donations on donations. But Pros testified that he didn't know he was breaking the law. He thought the money, he just, you know, this dude Jolo gave him $20 million to get a picture with the Obamas. And he thought of it as free money. And I got to stop there because look, um, mm, listen, I, I, if we are going to engage in this system of bourgeois white supremacist politics in which white folks do all kinds of shady shenanigans and get away with it, Citizens United. You, you have got to know the rules of the game and, and, and you have got to understand that don't nobody give you $20 million to get a picture with the president without wanting a little something. And that's not all that I, I just feel like this was, this was the criticism I have of Praz is that his belief that this was innocent was very naive. I, I'll put it that way. It's naive. It was naive. And I think that we can't afford to be naive if we're trying to operate in this very brutal and unforgiving white supremacist bourgeois politic, uh, political landscape. Okay. <sighs> so, um, so the trial, Pra's trial, which took about a, a week, included surprise testimony from other celebrities like Leonardo DiCaprio, who said he'd been friends with Michelle, I'm sorry, Pross, M Michelle is his last name, with Pross since the 1990s. And he testified, DiCaprio did, about his own business relationship with Joe Lowe that began more than 10 years ago and how that business relationship with Lowe led to Lowe investing millions of dollars into the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, a movie that probably would not have been made without Lowe's money because nobody in Hollywood was going to bankroll that movie. They, they just were not going to do it. And Lowe also donated a $3.2 million Picasso and a $9.2 million Basquiat to DiCaprio's charity. But not only Leo DiCaprio getting money from Lowe, but also Kim Kardashian uh, was revealed throughout this investigation uh, to have told the FBI that at some point she bought a Ferrari using $305,000 that Lowe had given her. And then the supermodel, Miranda Kerr, who dated Lowe for a brief time, received about $8 million in jewelry from this Malaysian billionaire thief, Joe Lowe. But even though the Justice Department said that the money Lowe used to finance the film and his contributions to DiCaprio's charities and the money he gave to other celebrities was stolen from the Malaysian Development Fund 1MDB that was supposed to benefit the people of Malaysia, nobody else that received this stolen money was charged with anything. Nobody else was put on trial. Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio got up on the stand and testified his rat ass against his friend since the 1990s, Pras. I'm just going to leave that one there with you. Uh, I, I, I saw this ca uh, this comment in the chat. Geechee Motivator, what's what what's up, my brother? Good to see you. Um, naive based off what I read so far is hard to conclude. Um, uh, and his arrogance. And I think there's a, a comment you put up here earlier. Yeah, this is the one. Uh, can I tie his Haiti moves and how that might have made him confident? made him confident or ignorant to make move like moves like this. Now in in my digging into this, I didn't dig into what he did in Haiti, but now I'm going to have to look into that because if he was able to operate in Haiti in a way that made him think that he was a political uh kingmaker in such a way, then maybe I'm going to have to retract my 
um, characterization of him of being politically naive and maybe deserving of what he got. But let me look into it and see, because I'm not, I'm not familiar with that right now. But thank you for bringing that up, because I am going to look into that. Woo. So, okay. So all these other rich white people get the proceeds of Joe Lowe's theft. None of them charged, none of them convicted of any crimes. But the other thing that Proz did that I think is really why he was indicted and convicted is his alleged role um, in a lobbying campaign to supposedly secure a diplomatic favor sought by guess who China. And this was allegedly the deportation of a person called Guo Wang Gui. I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Now Praz is supposed to have also alleged to have uh, helped Joe Lo find someone in the Trump administration to get the DOJ to drop to the investigation into the theft of 1MDB funds and to unfreeze his assets in 2007. But I really think the reason the DOJ went after Proz the way they did was because of this China thing. And this is where I went down my rabbit hole because Guo is a very interesting figure. He's a Chinese billionaire who was in self-imposed exile uh, and living in New York, of course, in a penthouse, in a multi-million dollar penthouse over, overlooking Central Park. And the New York Times described him in 2017, and I'm going to share this article with you, as the billionaire gadfly in, ex in exile who stared down Beijing. So this man claimed for years of deep corruption within the Chinese Communist Party. But even though he made those claims, even the uh, New York Times admitted that most of the allegations that he, he made were outlandish. Oh, here we go. So the New York Times said in this article from 2017 that Mr. Guo's allegations are unproven and some of his claims have been outlandish and easily debunked. Yet amid his barrage of charges about China's powerful and wealthy are claims that have turned out to be accurate. And the government's treatment of Mr. Guo, whose former political patron was one of China's highest ranking intelligence officials, suggests he may be taken seriously, perhaps even supported by some officials in Beijing. The article goes on to say the assertions if substantiated, could up in politics in China, the world, the world's second bi biggest economy, possibly driving a wedge between President Xi Jinping and Wang Qishan, the anti-corruption czar. The article goes on to say, um, they ask, is he ruthless or is he a hero, this Guo person? He says he has a plan to exercise graft from the party, breaking a uh, bring rule of law to China and put ties with America, here we go, on a stable track by ending decades of Chinese skullduggery on trade. <sighs> so <laughs> the, the New York Times painted him to be some anti-corruption crusader against China because really he wanted to improve relations between China and the, well, the U.S. and China um, by ending this thing called Chinese uh, spying on U.S. trade. I just, I, I'm telling you, you just, all you got to do is read the articles and the empire will just tell you the bullshit. So this really isn't about him actually being an anti-corruption crusader against China. When the, U, when, the, when the New York Times admits in its own article that you really can't believe a lot of what this man says because you can't substantiate it. A lot of it is bullshit. Really, this is just another uh, Chinese billionaire who... <laughs> who wants to get in good with the United States and keep the Chinese Communist Party 
from snatching his money. That's pretty much it. Uh, at other times, he explains his corruption allegations as an act of vengeance for a long ago death. The New York Times ends this article saying, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, in the middle of this article, they, they, they're they like, we don't know why he's making these allegations that can't really all be substantiated by saying he could be a man facing pressure, his assets frozen in China, mm -hmm, and had investments and lawsuits chipping away at his fortune. Um, they point to the fact that some of the allegations that Guo made uh, in, about um, the Chinese giant HNA, uh, a spokesman for HNA say, yeah, that's what he, this is just not true, is garbage. And then they, 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 they point this out, and I think this needs to be said and made clear. Over a decade ago, the Chinese Communist Party welcomed businessmen into its rank. You can have criticism about that if you want to, but I'm not going to sit here and criticize what another sovereign government decides to do in their government for their own interests. Okay, so this idea that there's this rampant, unchecked corruption in the Chinese Communist Party. How come when the Chinese Communist Party welcomed businessmen into the park? How and Xi Jinping has embarked upon rooting out corruption on the, the person who is the corruption czar was appointed by Xi Jinping. Okay. In turn, those tycoons help make the sons and daughters of the revolution rich. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's that's imperialist spin while helping the country show spectacular growth rates. Remember we talked last year with Dr. last uh, week, last Friday with Dr. Linwood Tauheed about the 700% rise in median income of Chinese citizens. So did let's, let's not even talk about the very small percentage, like maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand. Okay, if we're being generous, Chinese billionaires who might be rich, who, who might need to be rooted out for corruption of the 800 million people lifted out of poverty in China, they have experienced a 700% increase in the median income. I'm sorry, I, that's not, I think that's way more noteworthy than any corruption that people are, got their panties all in a bunch over in the, that's, but that's just me. I'm just not reading this as, again, I don't, I don't see that they're there, but this is what they're saying. Go down, Mr. Guo, who is a member of Mar-a-Lago, President Trump's private prom, Palm Beach Club, is eager, eager to get close to the powerful. On, on Tuesday, remember this is back in 2017, he wrote on Twitter that he flew to Washington for meetings at the Trump International Hotel, he contributed to charitable work, charitable work by Tony Blair, the former British prime minister who calls him a friend. And this article goes on to say, as with many of Guo's claims, it wasn't possible to verify who was on the other end of a call that he was on. He was a very, very important person. But the Times once again admits that many of this man's claims cannot be substantiated but they continue to prop him up as this, this great uh, uh, challenge to Chinese corruption and the, and, and the person who could bring the Chinese Communist Party down. Um, let's see, I think they talk here about, oh yeah, this, this, this is the, the death that he's supposed to be doing all this to avenge. He claims the state shot one of his brothers in 1989 and he has been plotting revenge ever since. The circumstances of the death are murky, <laughs> though much like much of Mr. Guo's story, uh, Mr. Guo says that during the 1989 Tiananmen student protest, he was arrested for giving money to the student movement and jailed for two years. But an overseas website, a Chinese website citing court documents said that Mr. Guo had been arrested in a fraud involving oil sales and that his brother was killed when he and Mr. Guo attacked police officers. They just, they just, they just put it in there. They just put it in there. 
So I'm I'm looking, I'm looking for, you know, this, you know, great evidence that this person is the great threat to the Chinese government. And at one point, the Chinese government did uh, ask Interpol to issue an arrest warrant for this man. But then they, they just kind of stopped going after him. They're like, you know, whatever. <laughs> okay, whatever. Anyway. But here's the part that I that really struck me as very interesting in relation to this this case with Pras. Because if this man was a member of Mar a Lago, a member of Trump's private beach club, and he was going to meetings at the Trump International Hotel, why did he need Pras to find somebody to help him do anything? Why I that's I'm very confused about that and I could be wrong about being confused about that but I'm very confused about that. Ed, that doesn't make any sense to me. If this guy Guo has all of these connections to Donald Trump how how come he needs pros for anything? I'm I don't I didn't <sighs> so I think I gave you that article. Um so the claim is that Pras was negotiating with the Chinese government to extradite Guo, but Pras and his attorneys claimed that he really wasn't trying to extradite Guo. He, he really wasn't doing it on behalf of, of the Chinese government, which is the argument of the Department of Justice to get Guo back. Pras claimed that he was working, he was trying to get an American woman who was pregnant, who was in China and was not allowed to leave China back to the US on behalf of the US government. This is what Pras testified and said, but that didn't fly. That did not fly with the United States government. The DOJ charged him with uh, 10 counts. And Praz admitted that he voluntarily talked to the FBI. <sighs> this is the other part that just like, yo, man. Whether, whether Praz was... Um, and I'm going to share another article with you, this Mother Jones piece that talks about how Pross um, was kind of named as an informant in entertainment press for the FBI. That's really, that that's not entirely true. He voluntarily met with the FBI and told him these things in their investigation of him. Um so in essence, he, he presented himself as kind of acting as an agent of the U.S. I, I just, and whether he did it as I, I, out, of, out of naivete, political naivete, or whether he did it out of a sense of arrogance, thinking he could do what the white folks do, it was stupid. It was done. How are you going to be... How are you going to make your bones in the rap game and end up talking to the fucking feds? I don't under, just, I... <laughs> so as I'm, I'm reading through this and I'm going down my rabbit hole, I start out feeling bad for Praz and I get to this point in it and I'm like, well, you dumbass. Well, I don't know what else you thought was going to happen to you. <sighs> when you, when you voluntarily talk to the fucking feds, but Okay, maybe I'm I maybe I should not be so but I'm just like, come on, man. Yes, he absolutely got sold out by his celebrity friends. He absolutely did. I think he I think in a way he he got sandwiched sandwiched into this thing. I think he was sort of the fall guy in this thing. I, I think he was absolutely for a, a target for something that I'm getting to at the culmination of this. Um, but I also think this brother didn't help himself, he ain't do himself no favors. Oh, okay. So let me go up. Hmm, this is a great point. Uh, Zizwe Chikugwa says, 
if China and the U.S. are two sides of the same coin, why is it that African states owe so much money to the U.S. controlled International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and not to Chinese banks? That thank you. Thank you for that. Mm, that point right there. So and, and, and here's the here's the other thing. Even if Praz believed in for whatever he did in Haiti that made him think he could make these kinds of moves on behalf of the U.S., Okay, I just don't buy anybody in China in the Chinese government thinking that Praz was the one they needed to talk to in order to get Guo extradited. I just, I'm sorry, I don't see it. I don't see it. I'm that's just me. I'm not seeing that. That's just ridiculous. I I'm willing to be absolutely wrong on that too. I'm always will, willing to be wrong, but I just don't see the Chinese government saying, "Yeah, we need to." It's Pras who we need to talk to to get Guo extradited, especially after the Chinese government stopped giving a damn about extraditing Guo. They were like, we don't care. Because you see, nothing happened. All, all of this kicked off in 2017. This guy Guo, according to the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, his allegations of Chinese corruption could have shaken up the Chinese government. Well, it didn't. The Chinese Communist Party continues to enjoy broad support, almost unanimous support, 90 something percent support among the Chinese people. So the Chinese government, they were like, we, OK, so we, we don't care about this Guo person. So I, I don't buy that part. But let's get to what this really is about. Because. Um. Let me see. Is this the other one? Yes. Let me see if I, I want to make sure I highlighted this. <clears throat> Let me make sure I find it. Oops. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Here we go. Where is it? Let me make sure it's here. There we go. This is the most important part of all of this ridiculousness. All of this. <laughs> and, and I literally got to the end of this article before I saw it. Because I swear, y'all, I couldn't see it until I got to this point. This is uh, the Wall Street Journal. And yeah, I, I shared this with you. Way down, way, way down, you get to this point. This is not the end of the article. This is about the middle of the article. This is the point. For the Justice Department, the prosecution of Mr. Michelle or Praz represented the latest test of its stepped up efforts to enforce the Foreign Agents Registration Act, an 85-year-old law that requires the disclosure of lobbying for overseas interests. The crackdown has met, excuse me, with a string of recent setbacks in court, but not this one, because Tra because Praz was convicted of violating, drop that there just in case I didn't share that with you before, because Praz was convicted of violating the foreign Agents Registration Act um, under the allegations that he was acting as a foreign agent on behalf of China in them trying to extradite Guo. This is important in regard to internationalism because the indictment against the African People's Socialist Party is based on their alleged violation of the same law, the Foreign Agents Relations Act, only with the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru Movement movement and the people named in that indictment, the foreign uh, entity is Russia. The reason process conviction is important to internationalism 
is that this Foreign Agents Relations Act is how this government is going to attack Africans of all dispensations. I, I don't know what process politics are. So I can't sit here and say that he has revolutionary politics. <clears throat> but I can tell you that this means a lot when actual African revolutionaries who are not popular entertainers at all, they ain't rich, they ain't got no money, <laughs> are, are, are indicted under the same law for the same thing, allegedly being agents of a foreign government. What is this, y'all? It's McCarthyism 2023. It's Red Scare 2023. It's the outside influence of the Africans 2023. It's the Russians and the Chinese and the communists telling the Negroes that they're unhappy in America. It's the Negroes doing the bidding of the foreigners. That's what this is. And just like the government used the tax code to go after the mob, that you do know how that's how the government broke the mob, right? They didn't, they weren't able to get them people on murders because they don't they know two organizations in this country have a an ironclad stop snitching code, the police and the mob. So they, they couldn't get the mob on the murders but they could get the mob on racketeering and tax evasion. So this is how the government is going to attempt to break the back of revolutionary international organizing in this country, the Foreign Agents Relations Act. And you don't even have to be revolutionary because they're using PROS as an example to let you know that you don't even have to be revolutionary. You don't have to have, you should not be having any, any dealings whatsoever. If you're an African in this country, you, you just need to rely on Uncle Sam. Because if you have any dealings with any foreign entity whatsoever, we're going to come after you. This is the, the conviction of Praz. This absolutely is re related to the attack by the U.S. government on internationalism and, and, and international solidarity in this movement. And it should not be confined to just African people. It's, it's the international working class movement in this country. This is how the government is going to come after us. Violations of the Foreign Agents Relations Act. So, I I really hope that that I made this stuff clear. But because when I was when I was looking at it at these things kind of separately, it's like, well, this is this kind of stuff. This is silly. It doesn't make any sense. Why? What? But but as I'm connecting the dots, it's like, oh <laughs> oh, this is just what the government do. They just do what they be doing again. And we'd be fools, we would be fools if we do not take the time and the effort to make the dots, do the investigation, dig deep into the dialectical materialism and understand that this is a concerted, organized effort by this government to try to destroy a growing movement of real working class, interracial, cross-cultural, international solidarity. That's what they see it happening. They are not unaware of our organizing efforts. We are not small potatoes to them, y'all. It's the APSP today. It's PROS today. Trust me. It's the rest of us soon. They're going to try. Now, I don't believe they are going to be successful in their um, attempts to convict uh, the APSP. I, I don't believe they're going to be successful. I, I do think, like I said, Pross's own uh, naivete, his, his hubris, his arrogance in thinking that he, because he is rich 
and maybe had some political success in Haiti, thinking that he could make the same moves, uh, you know, in this white supremacist settler colonial political system in this country. Um, yeah, no, we, we are not operating under, under those illusions at all. None of y'all better not be talking to the damn feds about anything ever. That's a mistake we will never make. <laughs> but when we're looking at the efforts to ban TikTok and that bill to ban TikTok, uh, I can't remember the name of the bill now. I know somebody's going to put it in the chat. It doesn't even really ban TikTok. It just, it, it actually gives uh, the state even more power to hijack your Wi-Fi and spy on you. <laughs> but, but, it, it, it uses the demonization of China to do it. To, to, to further, thank you, the, uh, the Gemon 93, the Restrict Act. I was, I was going through my alphabet and I was in that somewhere in the vicinity. The Restrict Act, it doesn't really ban TikTok. What it does is allow the government to hijack your Wi-Fi and spy on you and then, you know, demonize China in the meanwhile. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I am going to look into um, Praz's dealings in Haiti. And man, if that comes up with connections to the Clinton Foundation, I'm just going to be through. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. But anyway, I got to do my treatment. I knew this was going to take a, a longer than an hour, but I, I didn't mean to go a whole two. But here we are. And I hope that, you know, you learn some important stuff in this two hours. I hope that um, you realize I... The one thing I want you to take away from this show tonight, y'all, is to understand the incredibly dangerous moment we are in. You and me, we are in. Oh, I understand that we have a target on our back working for Sputnik. Sputnik, I, I'm under no illusions. I'm not inviting it, but if it happens, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> you, you understand? I, I need you to understand the dangerous moment we are in. And I think the worst thing that you can do is to be caught out here without the protection of an organization. Join an organization. That needs to be your response. Join an organization so you can know how to respond to these attacks. And you're, on, you're not out here by yourself in these attacks. So Black Myths is on. I need to do treatment. I'm also hungry and I'm tired. <laughs> I love y'all. Thank y'all so much for joining me. Uh, thank you, uh, the Gemon uh, 93. Yeah, y'all drop anything you have for me on anything we talked about tonight. Uh, send it my way because I'm always open to learn more. If I said something incorrect, if I've given incorrect analysis or incomplete analysis on something, you're welcome to clear me up. Uh, you know, drop, please let me know. I appreciate you. I love you as always. Ah, luta continua. The struggle, show sure enough, continues. But I promise you, y'all, if we keep struggling, Victoria Asserta, I believe it in my bones, victory is certain. So y'all take really good care of each other and take good care of yourselves. Peace. Good night.